the history of the American economy, and of all market economies, can be seen as a series of booms and busts, recessions and recoveries, superimposed on a long-run growth trend. For as long as there has been a business cycle, economists have been striving to understand what causes these disruptive fluctuations in the economy. And policymakers have been striving for better ways to predict and control them. Let's begin with an actual business cycle that occurred between 1987 and 1994. During those years, this graph shows how real GDP rose above, fell below, and then returned to potential GDP. Remember that potential GDP represents the long-run tendency of the economy to grow and is similar to the average level of real GDP over a period of time. This graph shows how inflation rose and fell within the same time period. The relationship between these rises and falls can be better understood by combining the data from both graphs into a scatter plot. Here, real GDP is on the horizontal axis and inflation is on the vertical axis. Potential GDP is represented as a straight dashed line. Movement to the left represents recession, and movement to the right represents recovery. Upward movement represents higher inflation, and downward movement represents lower inflation. The cycle here takes the form of a loop, in which real GDP begins and ends by being essentially equal to potential GDP. Now what we want to do is devise a framework, design a simple framework to explain this. And our framework is going to be much like the supply and demand framework, which we're all familiar with from microeconomics. You're about to see how an economic model can account for this circular movement. It's based on the behavior of two curves, one called the aggregate demand inflation curve, or ADI, and the other called the price adjustment line, or PA. Explaining the theory requires a number of steps. We'll begin by showing the relationship between interest rates and real GDP. We'll then show how changes in inflation affect interest rates. From there, we'll be able to derive a relationship between inflation and real GDP. Interest rates are the first part of the explanation. They have significant effects on investment, net exports, and to some degree, consumption. Let's start with investment. And let's suppose that there's an increase in the interest rate. What's that going to do to investment? Well, an increase in interest rates is going to raise borrowing costs for firms that are thinking about expanding or investing. Higher borrowing costs means that they'll invest less in equipment, less, invest less in trucks, maybe build a smaller building. So investment declines when the interest rate rises. Now let's consider the effect of a change in interest rates on net exports, the difference between exports and imports. Suppose the interest rate rises. A higher interest rate in the United States compared to other countries is going to make the dollar, investing in dollars, more attractive than investing in other currencies like Japanese yen. So the higher interest rate will raise the value of the dollar, raise the price of the dollar, because the dollar is more attractive. What does that higher value of the dollar imply? It means goods can be purchased abroad more cheaply, so imports are stimulated. It means it's more difficult for U.S. exporters to sell goods abroad because their goods are more expensive. And so as a result of that, net exports decline. So the linkage is higher interest rates cause the value of the dollar to rise, which cause net exports to go down. Finally, let's consider the effect of the interest rate on consumption. Let's suppose there's an increase in the interest rate. Now, an increase in the interest rate is going to make it more attractive for you to put some of your income away in a savings account or in a bank or even in the stock market and consume a little less. So that's why when interest rates rise, there's a tendency for consumption to go down. Investment, net exports, and consumption are all parts of aggregate expenditure. Therefore, when interest rates go up, the aggregate expenditure line, or AE line, moves downward. When aggregate expenditure goes down, real GDP goes down as well. The amount by which real GDP goes down can be calculated using the familiar 45 degree line. As the aggregate expenditure line moves downward, it intersects the 45 degree line at a lower level of real GDP. Conversely, 
When interest rates go down, the aggregate expenditure line shifts upward, leading to a higher level of real GDP. At this point, we can bring in the next piece of the puzzle, inflation. Let's assume that the central bank, which in the United States is the Federal Reserve, would like to maintain an inflation rate of about 2% per year. Sometimes, however, forces in the economy will cause the inflation rate to go above or below 2%. The Fed has the job of keeping inflation under control. And what it does is when inflation starts to pick up, or when it thinks inflation is starting to pick up, it raises interest rates. It raises interest rates by taking actions in the money market which bring about a higher rate of interest. Hoping the economy will slow down with that higher interest rate, the Fed hopes to bring inflation back down again. This predictable response by the central bank can be illustrated graphically. You can see, for example, that if the inflation rate is 2%, the interest rate is 4%. If inflation rises to 4%, the central bank adjusts the interest rate to 7%. This is a monetary policy rule that describes the behavior of the Fed. It's not, inflation is not the only thing that determines what the Fed will do, but it's a very big factor because the Fed has a responsibility for controlling the inflation rate. Now let's put the pieces of the puzzle together. Imagine that the inflation rate rises by a certain amount. According to the monetary policy rule, also known as Taylor's rule, the Fed would then respond by raising the interest rate. This would cause the aggregate expenditure line to shift downward, resulting in a decline in real GDP. Similarly, when the inflation rate falls, the eventual result is a rise in real GDP. Thus, the relationship between inflation rate and real GDP can be represented as a downward sloping curve. This is called the ADI curve, or aggregate demand inflation curve. Note that it slopes downward, just like an ordinary demand curve. Let's now add another element to this picture, the price adjustment line, or PA line. The PA line is horizontal, because the same behavior occurs no matter what the level of real GDP. The PA line tells us what the level of inflation is. Thus, looking at the intersection of the PA line and the ADI curve tells us the level of real GDP at any given time. Why does the price adjustment line move like this? Well, consider the case where real GDP is above potential GDP. In this case, the economy is booming, demand for goods is high, the unemployment rate is low, it's difficult to find workers, all the elements which tend to bid up wages, bid up prices, and make inflation higher. In that boom, the rise of inflation is simply illustrated by this higher rising price adjustment line. On the other hand, if we're in a slump, hard for firms to sell goods, hard for workers to find jobs, there's a tendency for prices to be bid down, for inflation to start to fall, which is illustrated by the decline, the lowering of the price adjustment line. Now let's see how the graph can be used to explain economic fluctuations. For example, suppose the Fed responds to political pressure by lowering interest rates, even though the inflation rate has not changed. As we've seen, a drop in interest rates leads to an increase in real GDP. The ADI curve shifts to the right. With real GDP now greater than potential GDP, inflation begins to rise. This moves the PA line upward. At the same time, the monetary policy rule tells us that interest rates will begin to rise as the Fed responds to higher inflation. For now, real GDP remains greater than potential GDP, so inflation continues to rise. Eventually, the Fed's increase in interest rates succeeds in returning real GDP to the level of potential GDP. That would be the end of the story. The Fed causes a boom in the economy, and we end up with a higher inflation rate. But let's add more to the story. Maybe the public will say, we don't like that high inflation rate. Let's reverse it. Maybe they'll have a new Federal Reserve chair come in. The new Federal Reserve chair will tend to reduce, want to reduce the inflation rate. So what it will do is the Fed will reduce the ADI curve back in the other direction. But with the economy in a recession, inflation begins to drop. The PA line shifts downward. Finally, Inflation returns to its original low level. Real GDP once again equals potential GDP. The economy is back where it started.
This circular pattern represents a complete boom and bust cycle in the economy. Does it look familiar? Compare it with the data you saw earlier, representing the real fluctuations in the economy between 1987 and 1994. The points trace out a circle, much like the original circle we started with in the data, and therefore give evidence that the model actually works in describing what happened. This fact that it matches the data, combined with the fact that as we built up the model, we checked the theory with the facts of investment behavior, consumption behavior, exchange rate behavior, net export behavior, etc., lends credence to the theory as a good explanation of what goes on in the macroeconomy. <laughs>